That's great. That's great. Take a Bible, look over to Isaiah chapter 53 with me, if you would. Middle of your Bible, Psalms, just past the Psalms, you'll find the book of Isaiah. And I'm glad you're here. We are still being plagued by sickness. So if you're well and all of your family is well, it's probably a product of you not being around people for the last six weeks. Humanity's diseased right now, and I can't believe how many sick people there are. The way I stay well is I just don't inhale. I get around all these people coughing and sneezing. No, I'm not going to breathe. I and mean, wear a mask or something. But uh, anyway, it's all right to be sick. Good grief. You're going to be worm food one day. Just get it done. Get it over with. Everything's good. Isaiah 53. And if you don't know the family, the Deanna at the piano is James White's wife. James, of course, taught her all she knows about music. Uh, and James grew up in the same era as Randy that was up here. And, and the girls are three of their five. I think there's five. There are five girls. Six, seven, eight. Bunch of little white girls. All right. Uh, I love seeing our... I love seeing our young people grow up here and raise families here, and I love seeing other young couples come. And young, young people are the life of the church. Dr. Hiles years ago came to our church, and, and he said, I like what I see, and all I could see was the tent and the mess. And, and I said, what do you see that you like? He said, I see enough young people to have energy to get things done. I see enough old people to have the right thing done. And got enough gray heads to keep this thing on track, and got enough young people to have enough energy to get it done because the gray heads are busy saying, oh, that hurts. <laughs> And what did they do? They blinked. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Good to be where we are. I love going to Ted Pardo's class because I'm the youngest person in the room. And uh, that's a good thing. Isaiah 53. Let's stand for a moment. We're going to read these first, just a couple of verses in Isaiah chapter 53. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of a dry ground. Right, he's, this is hundreds of years before our Lord's birth, but it's writing prophetically of Jesus. He shall grow up uh, as a root. Uh, I'm sorry. He shall grow up as a root before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, that, and uh, we shall uh, comeliness, and we shall see him. There's no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, and the, chast the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And let's pray. Father, bless us as we look at your book today. We thank you for a Bible that we can trust. Thank you for a Bible that's filled with things not only for truth and doctrine, but things for our soul and our heart, things that will help us to think right, things that will help us to handle our feelings and handle the hurts. We're grateful for a divine book, a holy book. We ask you to teach us from it today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated here in Isaiah 53. I'm going to quickly run through a... Uh, I'd like to go through an hour just on this chapter about redemption. You know, the Bible talks so much in Isaiah 53 and other chapters about how Christ died for you and what he did. He shall see God, shall see the travail of his, Jesus' soul, and, and he'd be satisfied. It's wonderful how God planned your salvation and my salvation. Hundreds and hundreds and years, thousands of years, go back before the garden. God had a plan to redeem you and to redeem me and to give us eternal life. That was all in the plan. God, uh, God has, a, has a burden. He loves us. But this morning, I want to take time and look at the person of Jesus just for a little while. And if you'd look there at verse, 50, or verse 3 of chapter 53, and keep your Bible open here for a minute. We're going to go back to chapter 50 in a minute or two. But look at verse 3 of chapter 53. It says, He is despised and rejected, uh, I mean, rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. You'll never find anybody as loving as Jesus was. Never in your world of relationships will you find someone who cared for people. You know the story in John chapter 8, the fallen woman, the woman who'd been actually caught in the act of adultery. There were Old Testament laws about adultery there in the Middle East and Jewish laws. And, and they brought her and accused her and said, well, Moses in the law says she should be killed. What do you say? And, 
They also said the guy should be killed, by the way, just as guilty. They didn't bring him. But um, Jesus is the worries where he knelt down, rode in the, in the dirt, and one by one people left. He said, he that's without sin cast the first stone. And eventually it's only him and this woman. And then he looked at her and he said, where are those then accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, no man, Lord. And he said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And Jesus, Jesus offered hope to the, to the fallen. John chapter 4, the woman at the well who'd had five husbands, was living with a guy she wasn't married to. and She'd messed up the morality of her life and her family and, and uh, her name and reputation. But Jesus gave that lady worth. And, and uh, he's the one who talked to her about the gospel. And she goes to town and comes out and brings half the city or the whole city comes following her out. And, and uh, he never justifies sin, but he gave sinners a chance. And he gave them a, a new start and a fresh start. And he loved people. He loved the fallen. He, he loved the multitudes. Jesus loved the, the crowds. The crowd came out to hear him preach and spent several days and there's no food. And after a few days, it said he had compassion on the multitudes. Well, it's their own dumb fault. Where was their survival bag? You know, they hadn't been to the survival store or whatever. But they followed him and they're out there a few days and, and there's no food. And so he, that's the story of the fish and the, the, the bread. And he breaks the loaves and feeds the 5,000. He cared about crowds. He cared about individuals. The one widow coming out of town and um, her only son, she, her husband's gone, her only son's lying there being carried out to the grave and, and he stops and he heals. Look, Jesus loved people. He loved individuals. He loved the hurting. He loved the fallen. He loved the broken. He healed the sick. He gave sight to the blind. He, he took the lame and, and made them whole. Yet it says of him, he was despised and rejected of men. At one point, Jesus was being accused of some things, and he said, wait, wait, which of you accuseth me of sin? Just name, name the sin I did. No one could answer. If I said, which of you could point at a time I've messed up somewhere, you, we'd be here the rest of the day. And none of my family members here but Josiah, and he wouldn't say anything bad about me because he needs my, needs my checkbook. But I've failed. I've failed as a husband. I've failed as a pastor. I've failed as a father. The, 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 the list is too long. But Jesus had no problem saying, which of you convinceth me of sin? Just bring it up. See, he never sinned. Sometimes we forget his holiness. We, sometimes we forget his, his perfect life. Every person he passed, he treated them exactly right. Every relationship, he responded perfectly. Yet he was despised and rejected of men. There's no incident of wrongdoing. He was never, there's never a person that Jesus hurt. There's never a person that said he, he spoke in an ill manner. Every word he spoke was a right word. He didn't, he didn't have to fit into our world, but he chose to fit into our world. And yet he was despised and he was rejected. Jesus offered forgiveness to the immoral. He offered life to the hopeless. He offered a hope to the defeated. He offered acceptance to the forgotten. There's a, there's a world out there of people who've been, who've been abused and neglected. He offered acceptance to all of them. He offered friendship to the lonely. Look at that list, if you would, there in verse 3. I'd like to just take a moment and point out each phrase, each word. It says he was despised. Why, what did he do to deserve to be despised? It's one thing for me to say, I don't like you. I don't like Nathan Mowry. Well, that's not a big deal. No one likes Nathan Mowry. No one doesn't like Nathan Mowry. But for me to say I despise him, that's a lot more to that. They didn't just say we don't believe his doctrine. They despised him. Look at the next one. He was a man of sorrows. His world was hurting. He, he, he was a man of sorrows. His world hurt. He got up in the morning. He walked through his day. His life was filled with sorrow and, and difficulty. Many of you, you've been there. I, I've got to admit, I've spent my life pretty blessed, more than I deserve, and none of us deserve anything. But, but I've, I've had a life where I was loved and cared for. And, but Jesus went through life a man of sorrows. Look at the next phrase. He was acquainted with grief. Now, that, just two things. I believe he's acquainted with your grief. I think he understands your loneliness. I think he understands your hurt. I think he understands, and he's acquainted with your suffering. But not just that. It's like this morning I was talking to a couple of our ladies sitting back here in the back in the early service, the 8 o'clock service, and, and um, they're uh, both widows, and, and I, I asked how they're doing. I said, uh, we got chatting a little bit. I said, evenings are hard, huh? 
See, since my dad's gone, I'm much more acquainted. I can't relate, but I'm a lot closer now. You know, the other day I was up visiting my mom and, and uh, pulled up to her house and spent a couple of hours there maybe. And, and uh, as I was leaving, she stood there on the front porch and I'm backing up and thinking, nobody knows what it's like to be there alone. And uh, one of the ladies, Cy Chamlin, she said, evenings are the hardest. It's just quiet and you're by yourself. And, and um, Jesus is acquainted with that. He understands it. He, he knows it. He, see, it's not just that he knows it because you've been there. See, I can't be, a, I'm not acquainted with being left alone. To me, being alone, oh, that'll be a blessing. <laughs> Is Paulatinian ever alone? <laughs> you mothers of multiple young children, you just, uh, alone? Oh, that would be so great. And just so you ladies know, when I counsel men, I tell them, hey, Give your wife some money, watch the kids, send her to Starbucks with a book, let her just sit there and do nothing for about two hours. That'd be a vacation. My wife would never do it, but I often did. I wanted to, look, take the car, leave, go do something. But I was so wonderful, she didn't want to be away from me. Uh, I understand it. I, I think I'm wonderful too. But, but he was a man of, he was acquainted. But see, it's not just that Jesus sees you over here and you're hurt. Even though he's here, he hurt like you hurt. He was lonely like you were lonely. He was rejected like you're rejected. He suffered like you suffered. He's been despised like you were despised. He was misunderstood. He was blamed for things he didn't do. It's not just, I went, I went to the jail to visit a friend who, who ended up in jail and I hurt for him. No, he was imprisoned and he was the one in bondage. He was acquainted, he is, he is acquainted with you, with your hurt, with your loneliness, with your grief, with all the misunderstandings. Look at that next one. We hid as it were our faces. He was ignored. Yes, uh, Friday, I guess it was Thursday, Friday, I was going down to pick up some brake shoes for my truck and going into the auto parts store. Just out of the corner of my eye, there's a car around a little bit near, near my, my truck as I pulled in. And there was a trunk open and a little guy in the trunk just barely able to reach into the trunk of the car. Couldn't bend four feet high. And I was already past him before I noticed him there. And, and I just thought, um, he's had people look away from him a lot. He's had people look at him a lot. He has been stared at. And then other people that try to be courteous, not stare. So then everybody turns away from him. How do you look? What's the right way? And by the time I got in there, I thought, I'm going to talk to him like everybody else. Yeah, but, you know, you have to catch that because mentally you, you're out of your comfort zone or whatever it might be. And, and but by the time I got back, he was gone. But, but I sat there thinking, I wonder how many times people ignored him. People hid their faces from him. Um, the, the feeling of being in society but not being in society. And he was like that in kindergarten. And in first grade, in second grade, you know what? Jesus knew what it was like to be looked away from. People hide their faces. Then look at the next one again. It says despised again. And, and then last, it says we esteemed him not. You know, to esteem is, is value. Um, several of our men in our church got some neat old cars. And uh, some of our lady, one of our ladies had a couple of neat old cars. I look at an old car as a dollar sign. You give me a Rolex, I will take a picture of it on my wrist, tell everybody I have a Rolex, and I will go sell it immediately before I fall down and break it. And put the money in the building fund or retirement or something. I mean, to me, an old thing is of no value unless you can cash it in. Because most of them are worth so much money, it's not, you know, here, the other day I saw a, a truck going down the road with this car on top of the truck. I don't know what it was. It was this old car that had to be worth a million dollars. And I thought, what good is that car? You can't drive it. You're afraid to. Sell it. Put it in my building fund. Take up this, put, put boxes in the space in the garage. But, but some people, they look at their old cars and they, that's cool. They like that old car. And I don't think there's anything wrong with it. They esteem that thing. It's like a trombone. I esteem a trombone as, you know, that one's probably worth 20 bucks. I'd sell it, put the money in the youth department. I can't play a trombone. It's of no value to me. But people looked at Jesus, and they didn't esteem him. They didn't think he had any value. 
And is it, you know what? Every one of us would like people to value us. Can I just say, one of the hardest things for a young person is to feel that their opinion and their person has no value. That's why as a parent, let me just say, kids, you're, you don't go telling your parents, do you know what the pastor said? Don't do that. They'll slap you. But I could never discipline my children publicly. I don't think that's esteeming them. If I get a ticket, I don't want the cop to drag me down the street behind the car with a sign saying he's a speeder. Give me the ticket, treat me with some respect, and go away. Um, don't pull me over again. Um, but but to, to, you know, to publicly or to in front of peers to discipline my children, I tried never to raise my voice. I tried to never discipline a child in front of other, their peers or other people. I, I'm out in public. I'm not going to discipline my child. None of us want to be esteemed that low. We all want value. For you uh, men or ladies to criticize your spouse publicly, you don't esteem them high enough. By the way, let me say this. To correct your spouse publicly... You say, well, it doesn't bother me. Then it probably does bother your spouse because you married an opposite. You know, well, we we're going up Highway 395 to Bishop. No, no, it was 295. Yeah, let me cut your tongue out and then we'll finish the story. Stop! The road is not the story. And your lousy attitude is ruining it. And now I don't even want to tell the story. I don't even know what we we're doing on Highway whatever it was. You know, that to lower the value of your spouse by making fun of them because of physical or verbal or emotional or, or whatever. No, nobody ought to ever hear about your wife's problems, men. Nobody. I don't think your wife ought to hear about your wife's problems. This is, this is Goddardism for just a minute. I don't correct my wife. I had two families leave our church over this comment. I'm saying it again and again. I believe it. I believe with all my heart, you're not your wife's Lord. She can choose to call you Lord. She can choose to honor you. But nobody gave you the dictator stick. That's just my opinion. And I could be dead wrong, but anyway, so far so good at 34 years this June. Um, does your wife make mistakes? I don't know. I got a terrible memory. It's smarter not to remember your wife's mistakes because if you get in a debate, she'll remember 10 for every one you remember. <laughs> Just be smart, man. Just smile and say, you're the best, honey. But, but to humiliate your wife or your husband, you know, I guarantee you, ladies, no man wants to be embarrassed publicly, corrected publicly, humiliated publicly, challenged publicly. You know, I say, hey, let's take the kids, gonna... let's, come on, kids, let's go outside and walk in the rain. Do you really think the kids should be out in the rain? Oh, obviously my brain wasn't on, and the Lord of all knowledge and wisdom just spoke. You just shamed your husband in front of the kids and God and everybody. So what if they catch cold? Better than your husband despising you. Let your kids get sick and die. You can make more. Allison, if you miss a couple, more food at the table, right? <laughs> when you got nine, what's two more? What's, two, what's seven, nine? <laughs> Look, I live with my wife. Every day of my life, obviously I'm out of town sometime, but I mean, she's my wife. I don't want to make her hate me. I'm not going to ignore her. I'm not going to shun her wishes. I'm not going to accept sometimes I do because she married a sinner. But Jesus never sinned. It says we esteemed him not. They placed no value on our Lord. And all of us want to be valued. Our children want to be valued. I think you ought to listen to your kids when they talk. And you say they talk all the time. Then teach them to shut up. Some of them, it takes years to learn that. Some of you, they never did learn it. And you're married to them. God bless you. Just hang in there as best you can. But you see, I'm, I'm on this side. I might be esteemed a little low. If somebody left our church because I said something stupid, I'd probably write him a note saying, look, I'd leave too, but I need the paycheck. But they couldn't say that about Jesus because he never did say a word wrong. I might have not been conscious and courteous and paid attention to someone in their hour of need, my children, my wife, or whatever. This morning, my wife's not feeling real well, so I said I'd make sure Josiah or Josh, one of the boys, would go pick her up, and I sent him a text to do it. He left his phone at home. 
told his big brother, and his brother forgot. And uh, so my wife's at 10.10, at 9.10, 10, I don't know what time it was. Anyway, just minutes before our class will start, she's still at home. All right, burn my toast. Throw clean clothes, dirty clothes in my clean clothes, clothes drawer, whatever you want to do to make me feel punished. But, but Jesus never forgot anybody. Jesus never neglected anybody. Jesus never humiliated anybody that didn't need humiliated. I'm not saying he didn't. I think he did a pretty good job with some of the Pharisees. But could I tell you, as perfect as he was, he was despised and he was rejected. Some of you, because of your health, because of your age, because of your, your ethnic background, you've had some things said or done. You know, Jesus never said a word that hurt a person. He loved people. Yet he was despised and rejected. Look over a couple pages back to Isaiah chapter 55, 0. I'm going somewhere. This is not the sermon yet. We'll get to the sermon in a minute. Isaiah chapter 50. And see, all these things we're talking about so far, these are all emotional things. Do you remember, some of you, are, some of you old enough to remember, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I heard that over and over and over in life. Quit your stinking whining cry baby. They didn't, you know, you go to a teacher crying. You know what I heard? Young people, just, just so you understand the horrible life some of us had. I'd have a teacher look and say, ain't bleeding? What are you crying for? I don't know how many times I've heard them say that to me and others. Oh, he hit me now. Can you see? Yeah, then shut up. I fell down. Where? Oh, no. Get out of here. If you don't need stitches, shut up. By the way, that's when we won wars, won Olympics. Anyway, now we got people. He looked at me funny. We're going to have laws about how you can look at people. Isaiah, you, you, said, you said mean things to me. Yeah, well, I do mean things too. You deserve it. You're such a knothead. Anyway, Isaiah 50, verse 6. Now we're talking about the physical things. Isaiah ver, ver, chapter 5, 0, 50, verse 6. I gave my back to the smiters. All this is about Jesus, but we'll just take out one verse here. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not, I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Jesus... The perfect Lamb of God, loved perfectly, healed, cared for, with an intimate passion for people, always concerned, always caring, cared about the widow, cared about the fatherless, the, the, fair, the rabbis, the teachers loved the crowds around him. Crowds had come, people of importance, and, and, but no children, anything like that. And one day Jesus is teaching a big crowd, and some kids start working their way up, or somebody tries to bring some kids up, saying, would you pray for my kids, bless my kids? And the, fair, the disciples, I mean the good guys, say, get those kids out of here. And Jesus said, stop it, those kids matter. Scooped those little kids up in his arms and said, such as these, the kingdom of heaven. Jesus loved children. Jesus loved the widow. Jesus loved the fallen. Jesus loved the multitudes. There's nothing he ever did wrong. And yet, he was despised. And now in verse 6 of Isaiah 50, he gave his back to the smiters. They beat him. His cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. And then it says, I hid not my face from shame and spitting. You know, maybe the thing that's hardest for all of us is to be embarrassed, to be shamed, to be falsely accused, to have something uh, thrown at you that is so wrong. One of the hardest things to me that I think, I don't care if you're a good politician or a bad one, I admire you for taking all the junk. Because if you run for public office, somebody's lying about you. And it used to be they didn't have anything but, you know, the telegraph. But now they've got Facebook and, and Instagram and social media and Internet. And, and they can smear you and your children and your dog. And, you know, that anybody's worried about how Mitt Romney carried his dog on a dog carrier on top of the car. My thinking is that's where you politicians all belong, up in the cage up there. But what a mess. But Jesus didn't even turn away from the shame. They spit on him. We were up in Chicago, so when one of our guys being nice, he saw this homeless guy just sitting there leaning against a building in the dark streets. And he just wanted to go give him a track. He just wanted to say, can I just give you one of these for my church? The guy went and spit right in his face. <laughs> 
humility. Now you find out whether you really love the guy or not. If you kick him, no, you didn't really love him. You wanted the noble pat on the back of being good to the homeless. But the guy was so shocked, he just turned and walked away. That guy spit on me. I can't believe who spit in my face. Yuck! Who knows what that spit's got in it? <laughs> Jesus didn't hide his face from the spit. Psalms 22. Turn back a few more pages to the psalm. I'll show you one more passage. All of our Lord's life was so perfect. There's no way that anybody could ever say enough, do enough, express enough the wonder of Jesus' life on earth. 33 years, actually only a three-year ministry when he was public. No way that, in fact, John said, the book of John was written, he said, these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that believing you might have life through his name. He said, but if all the things were written that Jesus did, the whole world couldn't contain the books. Jesus was so great, so good, so beyond description that according to God's own word, the world couldn't hold all the books of his wonder. But you look at him in Psalm 22, and that, again, is all about Jesus. Psalm 22 tells the story of the crucifixion. If you've not been here and I've mentioned this, cru crucifixion was brought into the world through the Romans many, many years later. When, when Isaiah, when Saul, David was writing in Psalms, crucifixion hadn't even been invented as a form of, 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 of capital punishment. And yet, right through Psalm 22, he describes it from the bones to the hands being pierced to the, everything, the, the bones out of the joint, the whole story. We're just looking at verse 6, though, of Psalm 22. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men. No one wants to be reproached. No one wants to be treated in a humiliating manner. But he was reproached of men. Again, the word despised, and he was despised of the people all they that uh, that see me laugh me to scorn again the words you see associated with our Lord on the cross despised and scorn and shame they shoot out the lip they shake the head he trusted in the Lord that he would deliver him saying uh, that he would deliver him seeing he delighted in him they made fun of what he said they made fun of what he did they mocked him they're people who were unloved by their spouse and I don't mean to berate anyone but over here on my side, this is our side of the platform over there's Jesus. If my wife berates me, there's some truth to it. Let's be honest. But if Jesus is treated with disdain, there's nothing wrong over here. If I'm... If one of my kids or all of my kids were to just abandon me and say, you're a lousy father, we want nothing to do with you, I messed up as a father. I've, I've not been a perfect father, and, and they deserve better, but they got what they got. And, and, and I would hate to lose the relationship with my children, but the fact is I'm not a perfect father, and, and, and that is well within reality of me losing the love of my children. But you know what? There's nothing he did to lose the love of his people. Never. There was never a moment but that he didn't act perfect in every situation. You know, you, you, uh, you didn't get to play so much. The coach might just have it in for you. The ref called a foul because he just doesn't like your ears or whatever. I mean, that could be that because we're all human. But if somebody misjudged Jesus, they were wrong because everything he did was right. You with me so far? Got a two-minute sermon coming. Just a minute. You're unloved by your spouse. I'm not saying you deserve it, but I'm saying you're really not all that good a spouse anyway. And I don't mean that to be cynical. I'm just saying, look, uh, we failed. We failed. My wife married a sinner, and so did I. I believe that the people who are my friends, the people I hang around, I think we try. I think we do our best. You know, as a, as a husband, you provide and you invest and you put your heart into your job and provide for your family, a house and car and, and church, and you do your very best, and, and they treat you with disdain. <clears throat> you know, everybody would like to be appreciated just a little for the 90 hours I put in the last two weeks or the last week. But the fact is, no matter how hard you worked, you've dropped the ball. No matter how many hours you put in, you failed. We've all failed. 
And if I get some reproach, and you know where Jesus said he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, if I get some of that grief, if I get acquainted with hurt because someone hurts me, and, and uh, someone comes to our church one time and takes <laughs> one statement and plashes it on the internet somewhere, well, he's a bigot, or he's a, you know, you know what? If you'd have been here long enough, you'd have probably heard it and wouldn't have had to lie about it. I probably did say something stupid. We try. But Jesus didn't have to try. He was perfect. You look over to Psalm 41 with me, just a couple pages over. Somebody would say, Pastor, I understand. I understand some wicked people are in the world, and they've hurt people. you with me, Psalm chapter 41. But you might say, oh, preacher, it wasn't wicked people hurt me. It was someone that loved me. I mean, my spouse hurt me. I can't imagine anything worse. I've watched my mom and many of our dear friends lose a loved one to death, and that's hard. But to lose somebody to divorce is harder, I think. To have somebody reject you. He was despised and rejected of men. To have someone say, I don't want you in my life, that hurts. I'm not saying it's, I mean, it's part of life. Half of us have been through it. My parents went through it. And it's just ugly. To be rejected is a horrible thing. To be rejected by somebody that was supposed to love you. To be rejected by somebody that, that you loved. And, and to care about somebody that's supposed to care about you. And something enters into that and suddenly the, the feelings are gone. It's, that's tragic. You know, it's one thing for a stranger to rob me. It's another thing for a friend to rob me. But look at Psalm 41 verse 9. He says in Psalm 41 verse 9, Yea, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread hath lifted up his heel against me. And Jesus said, you, I promise you this, he's acquainted with your hurt. You've had a friend hurt you, so did Jesus. Look over a couple pages to Psalm 55. There's a lot of these we could look at. I'll just show you a couple. Psalm 55. Some of you have been rejected. Some of you have been despised. Some of you have been, and some of you have been hurt by, I, I, again, I love my family. My parents, my dad left when I was about 10. A couple years later, my mom Marie Mary's and the dad that, that you know, Bob Ryan, my dad raised me. And, but I never had a bad home. I always had love. And, and we didn't have a lot of physical things. We always had a good home. But so you never had that. And I can't imagine not being in a home that's loving. I can't imagine my kids not being in a home where they are loved. I can't imagine you being in a home where you're not loved. It kills me to have somebody in my office where there's meanness and ugly words and, 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 and lewd words spoken of a spouse. I think, man, what is wrong with love in your home? And we can't fix a lot of sickness and we're going to accidentally say or do or be, but, but, but we ought to care about people. Psalm 55, look at verse 12. Psalm 55, look at, look at verse 12. He said, for it was not an enemy that reproached me. Then I could have borne it. Neither was it he that hated me that did magnify himself against me. Then I would have hid myself from him. Look at verse 13. But it was thou, a man my equal, my guide, and my acquaintance. Verse 14, we took sweet counsel together. We walked into the house of God in company. Look, we went to church together. We went to the Christian school together. We... Man, we were friends. We were in the same carpool. And, and how could you treat me like this? Those kind of emotions that run over people. I want you to understand Jesus knows those things. Verse 20. Verse 20, he says, He hath put forth his hand against such as be at peace with him. I've heard people say, I don't know why they'd be so mean. There were no problems. I didn't do anything. And they're just hateful. Why would they do this? I don't know. It's a wicked world, I know that. But I'll tell you this, Jesus knows exactly what you're feeling. He knows exactly the injustice you felt. Verse 22, where do you go? Cast thy burdens upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. There's no way that we're going to be able in earthly wisdom to logic with someone why they're evil. One of the biggest mistakes our idiot politicians are doing is trying to logic, logic with murderous people around the globe. You can't logic with evil. You kill evil. You jail it or you eliminate it. It's not hateful. 
It's just preserving the human race. When people are bent on killing others, they need to go away. Whatever your method of go away is up to you. Since no one's asking us anyway, it doesn't matter. But the fact is, we have an evil world out there, a hateful world out there. And for you to sit, let me just be very honest, sometimes for you to sit in logic with your spouse and say, why would you say something like that? You know the best answer? Because I'm a rotten sinner. My dad was a rotten sinner. I was conceived in iniquity. And I'm just a wretch. And no one ever says that. We all try to explain our actions. But the bottom line is, this is a messed up world. We, you young people, you're living in a messed up world. And you're going to have to get something between you and God. That's what he said there in verse 22. Cast your burdens upon the Lord. Don't try to intellectualize things. Don't try to figure out why would they do that? Because they're not you. Why would they be mean? Because they're wicked. I don't know why they do all the things they do. I'm just telling you, Jesus, all these verses have to do with our Lord. He is acquainted with your grief. Paul the Apostle wrote about it. You don't have to turn there, but in 2 Timothy, Paul said at my first answer, no man stood with me for all men forsook me. He's in court and not one Christian showed up to back the Apostle Paul. Not one. Again, Paul writes to Timothy in 1, 2 Timothy 4.10, Demas, his assistant pastor, forsook him having loved this present world. Demas said, you know what, Paul? I am done with the preaching and the getting rocks thrown at me. I'm going to go get a job and have a life. Paul knew what it was like to be abandoned by his friends. Paul wrote in Timothy, 2 Timothy 1.15, Paul said, Thou knowest that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. He said, all the churches have all given up on me. They've all turned on me. And then he lists some names of whom are Philagius and Hermogenes. Well, he names them. Can you believe that kind of hateful Christianity? The fact that Jesus hung on the cross one day and he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? His own father forsook him. And so you can imagine, you can, so you can relate. Now, let's just be honest. The sermon today is not, you should act like Jesus. Now, you know we should. Peter wrote that he was, the, he was uh, when he was reviled, he reviled again, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. And, 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 and Peter writes about how we are to follow in his steps, and we are to forgive, and we are to be kind. But let's just be honest. Ready? Are we all ready to be honest for about 10 seconds in church? We're all supposed to be like Jesus, and we're not. Y'all okay with that? I'm not going to be the kind of father I should be. I would like to turn the other cheek when you hurt me. But you know what? I'm going to curl up in some corner somewhere and soak in self-pity. I'm not going to lash out. It's not my personality. Some people lash out. I will just bathe in the cross. <laughs> in my own ego. We all, we're all got an issue. My wife can only... I will forgive my wife. I'll love my wife. But only so far. Say, what about that till death do us part thing, preacher? Yeah, I said that. Are we all willing to be honest for about 10 seconds again? You've not done it so well. So since we're all going to be honest for a couple minutes this morning, I'm not right now. I know we should. We should love. We should forgive. We should be patient. We should be long-suffering. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, gentleness, meekness. You get it in order. You know what I'm talking about. Read Galatians sometime. But that's not what I'm talking about. The whole sermon is this. Right over there is somebody who knows. He knows. He is acquainted with your grief. You're over there and you've had people let you down. Jesus says, I know exactly how you feel. Look, if our churches let you down, I'm sorry. It's a bunch of sinners led by a sinner with a staff of sinners. And no, we're not perfect. And by the way, compare your income this year to your tithe, and most of us are not perfect either, not even in our giving. And amen, Pastor. You know, how good are we at giving the gospel out? How good are we at witnessing? How faithful are we at prayer? Remember when Jesus said to the disciples he'd gone and prayed for an hour, and he came back and said, couldn't you even pray for an hour? Well, if, if the people, and I'm talking about us in this room since no one else is listening, if we, we all prayed for an hour, we'd walk away saying, man, I am the best Christian Jesus ever made. 
You know what Jesus would say? You only prayed an hour? I mean, just an hour? You can't pray longer than an hour? Understand, we're sinners, we're a mess, we're a wreck. And I'm not telling you you should be perfect. I'm telling you we ought to hit it hard. We ought to labor to be what we ought to be. But what I want you to know this morning is when somebody's rejected you, there's a Savior who knows exactly how you feel. When your parents have abandoned you, there's a Savior who was abandoned, and he loves you, and he cares about you. When you've had someone that you love turn on you and hurt you, there's a Savior who had people who he loved turn on him and hurt him. When you've had a, a nation that should have loved you, your government's messed up, the laws are messed up, the judicial system has been wrong. I sent an email this morning to a good friend of mine who's in jail for something he did not know was wrong that he did, and the judge said publicly, we're going to make an example of you. Now, can I tell you, that is not just. You want to punish me for what I did, you can do that. But to make me an example is not just. Now, we all think, what's wrong with that? It's not in the law. The law is you cannot steal. So whatever the punishment for stealing is, do it. Cut off my finger. Cut off my hand. But if the, if the law books say humiliate publicly, okay, then you can do that. That's what the law books say. You know, I'm writing you a ticket for going 20 miles an hour with a speed limit, and I'm going to double the ticket because it's a red car. And I never had a red car, and I always wanted a red car. You can't do that. But our judges are doing that, and our police are doing that. And I'm not anti-judge, anti-police. I'm just telling you. They're sinners. But Jesus never did anything wrong. And when somebody's been unjust to you, I want you to understand, as soon as you shed a tear, the Savior cares. As soon as you are shocked at someone not being just, he knows exactly how you feel. When you sit at home thinking, does anybody in the world love me? Can I tell you, there's somebody who loves you, who's acquainted with you. You sit there as a spouse and you think, and I've given everything I know how to give. I don't know what else to do to please them. I can't t fix your problem, but I can tell you this. There's a Savior who will hold your hand and say, I know exactly how you feel. And we hurt with crooked government and crooked citizens. I, I can criticize the White House and the governor's mansion, but I'll tell you, the, the preachers I know in America are just as crooked as our politicians. But he never did anything wrong. And when you hurt... You have got one person who says, let me hang on to you here. Let's go through this together. Let's, like you said a minute ago, I don't know if you're still there, but in verse 22, cast thy burden upon the Lord. He doesn't say he'll take away your hurt. He said he'll sustain you. He'll hold you up when everything else is wrong. All right, let's pray. Father, help us today. Thank you that we have a Savior that will sustain us in our hurt. Thank you for a Savior that loves us. This world is an ugly place. This world's been very abusive. Sometimes it's our family. Sometimes it's our government. Sometimes it's our church. Thank you for being the one person who understands. I'm so grateful I've got a Savior who knows what it's like to be neglected. And still from the cross said, Father, forgive them. Thank you for being a Savior that knows what it's like to have those who should love you not love you. And you still love them. What a wonderful Savior. Thank you for being able to sustain us. And thank you for being able to encourage us. And thank you that in a world where we might feel nobody knows the trouble I've seen, there is a Savior who's seen it and felt it and wept through it. Thank you that I have a Savior who loves me. And Lord, we pray this morning, if somebody here is not saved, they'd understand that all the burdens you bore were for their sins, that you took their shame and you took their punishment, that they might have life. May they trust you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together just for a moment.